Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about foreign policy and world affairs. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. And in this show, we discuss topical global issues, have conversations with foreign affairs thought leaders and newsmakers, and give you the context you need to understand the world today. Go to globaldispatchespodcast.com to learn more. And now on with the show. So the last time I spoke with my guest today, Mary Fitzgerald, was in mid-December, which now, of course, seems like a lifetime ago. Mary Fitzgerald is a researcher specializing in Libya, and when we spoke, the Libyan conflict was intensifying very rapidly. For months, a renegade general named Khalifa Haftar had been attacking Tripoli, the seat of the UN-backed government. That assault was locked in a stalemate until Russia increased its support of Haftar's forces, seemingly turning the tide. But then Turkey announced that it was going to ramp up its support for the Tripoli government, setting the stage for a proxy war between Russia and Turkey, among others. So that was the state of play as we entered 2020. Then, in mid-June, forces backed by Turkey finally ended Haftar's offensive on Tripoli. Now, his forces are very much on the retreat. Needless to say, this was a dramatic turn of events in a civil war that has profound international implications. In addition to Russia, the UAE, Egypt, and France have given political or military backing to Haftar, at least until now. Meanwhile, the position of the United States has not been consistent, at times seemingly encouraging Haftar and other times backing a UN peace process. Now, with the situation on the ground having changed so rapidly in recent weeks, I wanted to have Mary Fitzgerald back on the show to discuss these latest events and their broader international impact. So back in December, when I spoke with Mary Fitzgerald last, the title I put on that episode was something like, Libya will be the major international crisis of 2020. Now, if not for the pandemic and economic crisis and transnational civil rights movement, I think that still would be the case. Needless to say, Libya is a major global story that's not getting the attention I think it deserves. So I was very glad to have Mary Fitzgerald back on the show. As always, please feel free to reach out to me if you have suggestions of people you'd like me to interview or topics you'd like me to cover. I love hearing from you guys. Also, if you have a chance and you haven't done so, please do review the show on iTunes or Spotify or Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to the show. Give it a a few stars if you can. All right. Now, here is my conversation with Libya researcher Mary Fitzgerald. Just a recap, this war in Tripoli started um, in April of last year when Khalifa Haftar, um, a 76-year-old uh, commander based in eastern Libya, uh, launched an offensive against the uh, internationally recognized government known as the Government of National Accord or GNA in, in Tripoli. It was an offensive that he uh, pledged would be swift and uh, relatively bloodless um, he uh, claimed that the, the people of Tripoli would rise up in support of him and his project and vision uh, for Libya, which his opponents say is essentially wanting to impose himself as, as military ruler. Didn't quite uh, work out that way, to say the least. Um, and uh, both sides got bogged down in this um, this grinding war. When I was in Tripoli in, in December, there was very much amongst the general population and um, a sense of fatalism. Uh, people were were weary from the war, a sense of fatalism, a sense that their destiny was not in their own hands. And that fatalism was fed by the fact that it was no longer really a Libyan war. That war that Haftar had started in April last year had become so internationalized at that point. And in December, it became even more so and even more fraught in that respect when Turkey um, signed an agreement with that government of national accord in in Tripoli that basically boosted uh, Turkey's intervention in the Libyan war um, to the detriment of Haftar and his backers, because now we're in a situation um, in in June where uh, Haftar's offensive is over. It's it's failed, essentially. Um, He has lost 
uh, his bases, his uh, his assets in Western Libya, the towns that he was in control of. And it was essentially Turkey uh, that won the war for that internationally recognized government in Tripoli, which, of course, introduces a whole new dynamic now in terms of because the war is not over. Um, it may be over in Tripoli, but the war has now um, spilled uh, towards the east. Can you just remind who were Haftar's uh, forces and backers? Well, Haftar, uh, back in in, uh, 2014, in February that year, uh, was accused of of attempting a coup by the then uh, sitting prime minister. A few months later, he launched a military offensive in Benghazi, Libya's second city. At the same time, his militia allies in Tripoli physically attacked the um, parliament in Tripoli. And this gave very much a a sense amongst those who were already suspicious of Haftar and his aims that what he wanted to do was uh, basically install himself as as ruler of Libya. He, meanwhile, gathered a considerable support base by saying that he wanted to uh, tackle the problem of, of extremism in Libya. He wanted to build a proper um, army and, and police. And those have essentially been the, 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 the contours, if you like, of, of the, the, str- the power struggle since 2014 between those who support Haftar either out of personal interest, and he has a number of true believers who are driven by personal or tribal interest to, to form alliances with him. Um, But also a segment of the population that did believe that um, he wanted to build a proper army and police, did believe um, that he uh, was sincere in wanting to to tackle extremist groups. But then on the other side, you had those who were suspicious of him from the start and believed that a lot of these narratives he was pushing were pretexts to basically his dreams, his aspirations to install himself as military ruler. So that has been the kind of arc since 2014 of the conflict. There have been different, um, the conflict has gone in different ways over the last uh, six years. You had uh, the, a dynamic where uh, so-called Islamic State was involved. They were largely fighting Haftar, etc. But, but but those contours of, you know, Haftar, uh, the man and his ambitions um, that has been the single overriding arc since 2014, whether you support Haftar or whether you're opposed to him. And, and you know, in the process, he was able to gain the support of key actors like Russia and the UAE, right? Indeed. Uh, since 2014, his um, most muscular backers, if you like, have been the United Arab Emirates and Egypt. Russia was a little late uh, to the game, so to speak. Uh, the UAE and Egypt were, the UAE was driven particularly uh, through support of, of Haftar's aim, as he put it, to purge Libya of the Muslim Brotherhood and its associates. There was a sense um, that Abu Dhabi didn't want um, another Tunisia in Libya, and we all know what, what that means in terms of inclusive politics. Uh, Egypt was concerned about the security of its border and felt that while uh, Haftar was not perfect by any means, he was the best um, option at the time for, for Cairo to secure its border with, with Libya. Um, France started supporting um, Haftar in 2015-2016. It has supported him in different ways, including militarily on the ground, but also critically diplomatically, which has undermined a common European uh, approach to, to, to Libya. And Russia in recent years has uh, supported Haftar while claiming publicly that it engages with all actors in in Libya. But what we've seen in recent months is really a a lot of revelations, if you like, about the extent of Russia's role. When Haftar's forces were um, retreated from the the Tripoli front lines, uh, with them uh, were uh, many, many um, Russian mercenaries, uh, thousands of Russian mercenaries estimated to be in Libya and fighting for for Haftar. This mix of, you know, Haftar fighting for Tripoli, backed by a number of powerful foreign governments versus the GNA, the Government of National Accord, backed by other powerful governments, you know, was the context in which we spoke in in 2019 in December. Um, How had the fighting evolved over the last six months? And how was it that uh, just in early June, Haftar's forces had to flee from Tripoli. 
Well, as uh, many within the anti Haftar camp uh, will will readily admit and acknowledge, it was it was Turkey that won the war for them essentially uh, for that internationally recognized government. When Turkey started weighing in in December last year, it was in you know quite um, a robust way, um, and Turkey did not hide its intervention. Uh, Erdogan was regularly talking about uh, the intervention and the reasons, as he put it, uh, why uh, Turkey was was intervening in, in Libya. Uh, Ankara installed air defense systems um, in and around Tripoli. Uh, it provided the GNA with, with drones um, and also, and very controversially, provided them, uh, funneled, uh, I should say, mercenaries from Syria um, onto the, into, the, into, into Tripoli. Um, and that was controversial in all kinds of ways. It was controversial in terms of the pro-Haftar camp uh, were appalled at the injection of these Syrian mercenaries on the ground. It also caused considerable unease within the anti-Haftar faction, um, who felt that this was um, you know, something that was more of a, a burden rather than um, an asset. But those, all those um, aspects of the intervention ultimately contributed to um, that government of national accord um, being able to rout um, Haftar uh, within a few weeks, after it, it was almost like a domino effect. After lost control of a series of, of towns in western Libya, he lost a key uh, airbase, Watia airbase, and essentially that created a momentum where his forces melted away and, and retreated. And so where do things stand right now? We're speaking in the middle of June. Presumably he, uh, Haftar's forces are encamped somewhere. Um, and presumably the GNA's forces are on the sort of attack and on the move trying to defeat him. So what's the current situation? Well, right now all eyes are on two locations. Um, number one, Sirt, uh, Gaddafi's hometown, um, and a, a city that basically... Haftar's uh, forces had taken control of. Um, CERT is basically one of the locations that the anti-Haftar forces have um, in, in the cross uh, areas because if they manage to take CERT, then they, then they can push further east into the so-called oil crescent, which is currently controlled by Haftar's forces. And this is one of Haftar's selling points internationally, or it has been this idea that Haftar's forces are in control in areas of Libya where most of Libya's oil um, is is concentrated. Uh, That has been one of his um, assets, if you like. Um, And the other location that's uh, very much uh, of focus right now is uh, Jufra, uh, which is in central Libya. Jufra is a a very strategic airbase that Haftar has used to to great effect. Um, It's been, in many ways, his main um, air base in terms of the the Tripoli offensive, and <coughs> excuse me, um, it's it, Jufra is, is where Africom recently talked about Jufra in that it announced in a statement that fourteen Russian fighter planes had recently been transferred there, um, and raising the alarm about the the growing uh, Russian presence on the ground. Um, Africom, in- the U.S. African Command. Yes, indeed. Hmm. So. What diplomatically is a state of play? I mean, one of the key kind of themes that keeps emerging is the extent to which foreign actors, principally, you know, the ones that you've named Turkey, Russia, UAE, France, Qatar, um, where does the diplomatic momentum stand right now? Is there any diplomatic momentum to try to resolve this in a way that doesn't uh, include a whole lot of bloodshed on the ground? Well, everybody's talking about what may transpire now between um, Turkey and Russia. So Turkey and Russia seem to be the new, um, if you like, international kingmakers of of Libya. Um, Turkey feels it's on a roll. It has uh, managed to rout Haftar in support of of the the government of national accord. Um, Russia is still there and building up its its presence um, on on Haftar's side. So there is a sense that um, both Ankara and Moscow realize that they are the most prominent uh, external players in in Libya right now. And um, there's a sense that they both carve out spheres of of influence for themselves in the country um, in in the aftermath. But of course, um, there's no guarantee that that's going to be a smooth process. Just a few days ago, um, there were supposed to be talks between uh, Turkey and and Russia uh, focusing on Libya. And in the end, uh, it wasn't 
quite explain why those those talks didn't happen. So, you know, there have been warnings um, and the French uh, foreign minister uh, la- a few weeks ago warned of what he called the Syrianization um, of Libya. So there is a concern that if Turkey and Russia are not able to carve out those uh, spheres of, of influence within Libya for themselves, that we may see that Syrianization. There, but there's also a concern that if Turkey... Can, and can I say, like, what, what do you mean by Syrianization? Or is this the idea that foreign actors will be controlling militias on the ground to a greater extent than they are today in Libya? Right, but the contours of that would be along the lines of Turkey's um, uh, Turkey's allies in Libya and Russia's allies in Libya, where it's been a kind a different dynamic in the past in in Libya. So it would be more we would see a fragment fragmentation on the ground, a testing of those Libyan alliances on the ground, but with Turkey and Russia as the main um, main sponsors. But there's also a concern um, regarding a, the scenario where Turkey and Russia would carve out spheres of influence for themselves. So what would a Libya look what would Libya look like if that was if that actually happened? Um, would we see a de facto partition of Libya? So we would because Haftar and his camp are, are based in eastern Libya, would that mean that we would see some kind of um, Russian um, Emirati protectorate, if you like, emerge in eastern Libya while Turkey um, builds on its influence in Western Libya. And there have been reports in recent days about Turkey and talks with the GNA about using um, some air bases in Western Libya. And there's been a lot of speculation about that in terms of, you know, what is payback for, for Turkey here in, uh, in Libya now that it contributed so much uh, to to pushing Haftar back. Um, there was a sense when Turkey weighed in in December that this was very much an opportunistic uh, move by, by Turkey um, to see how it could expand um, its influence on the ground in, in Libya. So neither scenario we're faced with now is... Um, you know, particularly positive one in the eyes of, of many Libyans. And, you know, I think one very important point to make here is that the conversation on Libya has become so uh, geopolitical um, in, in recent weeks and recent months that it's often overlooked um, the fact that the war um, Haftar waged on Tripoli for over a year was not a popular war. Um, this was a war that um, was not welcomed. I mean, the people of Tripoli did not rise up for, for Haftar, as he said uh, they would. And then as the civilian casualties um, uh, increased, uh, people got increasingly anger, angry. So this is why at this point, you know, Haftar has uh, frustrated his backers. He's disappointed his backers. He's 76 years old. Uh, clearly his project, if you like, um, has not gained the currency and momentum in Libya as he and his backers would have liked. So there's a lot of speculation recently that his backers are looking to possibly move him aside, quietly retire him and find somebody else to, to replace him in Libya. But quite frankly, any, any, any Libya specialist looking at uh, the landscape in Libya right now, particularly Haftar's uh, camp, there is no obvious figure there um, who, who could replace him. Your point about the sort of geopoliticalization of this conflict, the internationalization of this conflict, um, in it was sort of, it makes me wonder, you know, to the extent that there is some sort of de facto partition of the country along the lines of what you described, um, to what extent does that ignore like the localization of this conflict? So, for example, you know, the the GNA, the Government of National Accord, the UN backed government, from what I can tell and for what we've discussed is really a collection of, of militias. And to what extent are they just a collection of militias under this umbrella because they are fighting Haftar? And if Haftar is out of the picture, do they start fighting each other? Do they scramble themselves for resources? What happens then? Well, a lot of the work, and it was painstaking work that had been done in, in recent years in terms of tackling um, that militia problem, if you like, in, in Western Libya, um, a lot of that was upended when Haftar launched this offensive in April last year. And for someone who, you know, many Libyans, many of his opponents would say that Haftar is essentially the commander of, of a collection of militias. They don't see his forces as the army he tries to present them as. But the militia dynamic in, in Tripoli 
um, was in, in many ways strengthened and consolidated by the, by the offensive that Hafter launched uh, on Tripoli. So ironically for someone who was telling his supporters that he wanted to tackle the militia um, dynamic in, in Tripoli, he ended up arguably making them um, much stronger. So, you know, that means that the conversation in terms of demobilizing militias, tackling the militia issue, um, has, has to change completely. It's a different conversation now than the one people were having over a year ago. Um, so in, in many respects, people will have to go uh, back to, to the drawing board on that. Um, but also, I think this, this, this idea of partition, and it's something that we often see um, commentators who are perhaps not very familiar with the Bolivian context, every so often we'll see, you know, they'll write a piece raising the question of whether you know, partition will, will happen in, in Libya. And we've been seeing those kind of pieces, quite frankly, since 2011. And I think that, you know, I've always pushed back against this idea that, oh, partition is looming in, in Libya because, you know, it, 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 it often overlooks the fact that Libyan society is quite, you know, it's closely knit. It's, Libya is just, its population is only 6 million people. And there's been a lot of um, movement between East and West Libya. You know, families intermarried, a lot of people from Eastern Libya West, living in, in Western Libya and vice versa. And those dynamics have shifted slightly in, in recent years, but there is still inter- it's still socially very mixed. What has been very striking, though, is this war that Haftar started on Tripoli and um, really, in terms of the the narratives and the the propaganda that surrounded that war, um, but also as the um, as as the suffering in Tripoli uh, in particular increased, you saw a hardening of attitudes. So uh, the rhetoric used in in Libyan media, etc., on social media, started hardening into this east west um, frame, which was really really worrying. Um, and we see that continuing today. Um, and there's been a lot of talk in Libya about how much this war has torn the social fabric. Libya's social fabric has, uh, you know, has has been torn for for many years uh, since 2011. But this this last year was something uh, quite different. And what we've seen in in the last couple of weeks since Haftar's forces uh, retreated from around uh, Tripoli is um, the fact that um, so many ma- mines, landmines, were planted um, around uh, uh, the, the neighborhoods where Haftar's forces had dug in, residential neighborhoods. So we see that um, civilians are regularly killed or maimed um, as they come across these mines. And this is, again, um, causing a lot of anger and feeding a kind of a bitterness. In recent days, um, the the UN has um, has said that it was shocked by the discovery of several mass graves um, in the town of Tarhuna, on the outskirts of Tripoli, which was one of the main stronghold for Haftar's forces. Many questions about uh, what happened there and who may have been responsible for this. Um, uh, but it shows that um, there are many things have happened over the last year that have really entrenched um, a sense of resentment and anger and, and bitterness. Uh, and that is increasingly drawn along east-west regional lines, unfortunately. So given that sort of local context that you just set and the kind of global geopolitical context of you know different countries, different powerful countries having competing interests in Libya right now, I mean, what prospects are there for a diplomatic resolution to this crisis that you know is broadly accepted and one that sort of ends just the the, the fighting on the ground? The prospects for that, I'm, I'm afraid, I think most people would agree, are are very slim. Um, the the UN and other internationals have put great store uh, recently um, in the fact that the so-called five plus five talks, which are basically bringing military figures from uh, Haftar side and the anti-Haftar side uh, together, that they had restarted. Um, not many Libyans have any great kind of confidence um, in in those talks, uh, to be quite frank. Uh, you also have a situation where the uh, government of national accord on its in, internally, but also within its support base, you have people uh, divided between those who 
feel that um, what the focus now should be on removing Haftar uh, from the scene so he will not play any role in, in future. And they have, you know, many um, ideas in terms of how that should happen, including pushing further into eastern Libya, his stronghold in, in eastern Libya. There are those who feel that um, some kind of negotiated settlement should happen, but um, they feel that uh, Haftar needs to be weakened further before they're in a better place uh, for that negotiated settlement um, to, to happen. It was interesting um, how within a short, very shortly after Haftar's forces retreated from the Tripoli front lines, um, uh, Egypt convened a meeting in Cairo. Uh, Haftar was there and Aguila Saleh, the head of the, the parliament based in eastern Libya. It was essentially an attempt to, to salvage Haftar and his supporters from the disastrous um, uh, for them, uh, developments in, in Tripoli. But again, there was a lot of skepticism about that in Western Libya um, and showed how wide the gap is here in terms of reaching um, a diplomatic uh, settlement here in terms of bringing the two sides together. You have a, one side now that feels flush with what he sees as, as victory, um, and you have another side that has um, remains, uh, you know, uh, retains powerful external backers. Um, so there is very, very little space right now, I think, for a negotiated settlement, unless it comes through that uh, Turkey, that idea of a Turkey-Russia uh, grand bargain um, I mentioned earlier. Turkey and Russia tried to um, put together this grand bargain, if you like, earlier this year, at the beginning of the year. But it fell apart when Hafler essentially walked out on it and, and refused to have anything to do with it. But I think it's fair to say that right now, um, diplomatically, the prospects of a negotiated settlement anytime soon are, are quite slim. There's still too much to play for on the ground. Uh, well, Mary, thank you so much for your time. This was very helpful. Thank you for having me, Mark. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Mary Fitzgerald. That was helpful. And as I said at the outset, uh, if you have suggestions of people I should interview or topics I should cover, please reach out to me. You can also just reach out to me with whatever is on your mind. I love hearing from you. I love checking in with you. So uh, feel free to send me an email. Let me know what is going on in your world. Thank you. Bye.